We sang that on Wednesday night, and I told Kenny after we were done singing it, uh, I said, I just had to sit there and listen to that one. Uh, In the darkest valley and when your world shattered, you can still praise God. I hope you can sing those words. I hope you can sing them and mean them. Today we're we're talking about some of that uh, devastation, some of that darkest valley. Um, I'd like to go ahead and start off with prayer and then share a couple of statistics with you. Will you pray with me? Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you for this time that we can look at Revelation chapter 15. And I pray that uh, you be with me right now as uh, hopefully the words that come out of my mouth are straight from you. And I pray that uh, you be with everyone that's here. I pray that that whatever uh, message you have for them, that, that it is directly placed on their heart this morning, that uh, when they walk out of this place, that they are uh, forever changed to be a, a stronger follower of you, one that wants to worship, one that wants to sing, one that wants to love you and follow you with every part of their life. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Uh, let me start off with these statistics. First, today... About 925 million people experience hunger on a daily basis. That's more than North and South America combined. The poor spend up to 75% of their income on food alone. Worldwide, one in four children don't get the nutrition that they really need. Approximately 145 million children are underweight and at risk of dying simply because they don't get the the nutrients that their body needs. We don't really have a clue what that's like here. In America, most of us are probably overweight, not underweight. A child dies from hunger-related causes every 15 seconds. Now, see, there's, there's something in us, though, as people. We want the hungry to be fed. We want the homeless to have a place to go. We want the thirsty to have something to drink. We want the lame to walk. We want the blind to see. We want the weak to be protected from injustice. We want children not to have to deal with those hunger-related causes. We want children not to have to worry about being abused or raped or abandoned. We want them to be cared for. We want them to be loved. The reason why we're incapable of accepting life as it is here on this earth is because we were made, we were created, we were destined for something so much bigger, so much more than what we have here. And no matter, no matter how many songs or how many things we read about how wonderful and amazing the world is that we live in, it is not wonderful. There have been all these different world religions that try to to reason why we feel the way that we do. What we need to do to make ourselves feel better. How we feel like we're going in the right direction. But most of the time we don't get it. God calls us to take care of the poor. He calls us to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, and to be there for the widows and the orphans. And he does that because they're always going to be there. As long as we're here, living in this messed up world, those people are going to be there. And by no means am I saying that we shouldn't try to help them. We shouldn't try to be there for them. We shouldn't do what we can for them because that's what God calls us to do. But this world is not wonderful that we live in. There are always going to be those that need to be taken care of. In this Revelation series, Miles mentioned a question that's often asked, and it's a question that I now I've been thinking about quite a bit, and maybe as we talk about these statistics, maybe it's one that that you kind of wonder about. It's the question of how long. How long are we going to live in this horrible world? This world that has so many hurting people, so many people that are being taken advantage of. Maybe some of you struggle with depression. Maybe some, some of you struggle with despair. You struggle to provide for your families or take care of those that that you love. And you can't help but wonder, God, how long? How long are we going to have to live like this? 
in Revelation 14, which we talked about last week, we see that there is a day set on the calendar when, harv- when the harvest is ripe, it says. It's not a day that we know. It's only a day that, that God knows. But it's the day that can start to answer that question, how long? In Revelation 15, we pick up the story today, you and I, who are Christians, sons and daughters of God. If you would go ahead and turn to Revelation 15. We find ourselves before the throne of God at this great and wonderful day. And and what we find in the book of Revelation is this is the reason that we sing. That's what we're talking about today. The reason we sing. Kenny's, Kenny's communion meditation was perfect. Perfect for today. The reason that we sing Let's read Revelation 15 together. It's only eight verses, won't take us very long, but let's just read it straight through. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and over the number of his name. They held harps given them by God, and sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this, I looked, and in heaven the temple, that is, the tabernacle of the testimony, was opened. Out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean, shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chests. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God, and from, from his power, and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. With the things that, that Miles has discussed in past sermons and getting us into this Revelation series, maybe you read this and maybe you feel like you're starting to get it. You're starting to understand some of the symbolism that's, that's used throughout this book. That's kind of where I was when I first read it. I thought that I was starting to get it a little bit. I thought I understood quite a bit of it, actually. I was, I, I was even able to see, when reading some of that, some of, the, some of the correlation back to the book of Exodus. But starting out here in the first verse, we see that, that this is the last group of plagues that God is going to use. It's the completion of God's wrath. It's going to be his wrath that, that doesn't just hit a quarter of the people anymore. It doesn't just hit a third of the people anymore. It's not like the seals and the trumpets. We're at the bowls now, and this is going to hit 100% of the people now. God's wrath isn't going isn't to let any slide by. And yet for everyone who is victorious, everyone that's been worshiping the true God and not falling away to this beast, worshiping things like, like sex and money and power, success or even their own lives those that are are worshiping the true God we will find ourselves in the presence of God enjoying God and most of all worshiping God singing to him the question of how long at that point it's gone we no longer care about how long because we're in it we are consumed by being in the presence of God so thankful that the that the junk we were living in, the people that were going through all the times of hunger, the children that were dying because they couldn't, couldn't eat, that stuff's over with. And we're thankful. There's no longer an obstacle that's in our way. We're worshiping God Almighty together, standing before the sea of glass. I was talking with Miles earlier this week about some of the details of this passage. And one of the things that he mentioned to me was the single word that makes such a difference. If you look back into Revelation 15 in the NIV, it mentions all those that are victorious over the beast standing beside the sea of glass. But instead of beside, probably a better translation 
A better interpretation is actually before the sea of glass. This is where we get a pretty clear image back to Exodus. If you have your Bibles there, flip back to Exodus 14 and 15 and take a look at those stories. Just, if you would, just look at the titles of those stories. And if you've, if you've been a part of the church, you're going to remember that's when, that's when Moses is leading the Israelites out of Egypt. And he gets to the Red Sea. And he crosses the Red Sea because God stops the water and gives them a dry path to, to move across on. They get to the other side. The Egyptians, the Egyptians try to follow them, and God destroys the Egyptians in the middle of that sea. And in Exodus 15, they're standing on the other side, and they are singing to God. They are celebrating because of what God has done. He has rescued them. He has brought them across the Red Sea, defeating the, the, defeating the Egyptians and giving them freedom from the Egyptians. As worshipers of God in Revelation 15, the only difference between them and us is where we're seen in this picture. The Israelites are standing on the other side of the sea. We are worshiping God before we even cross it. We're celebrating our victory over God's wrath, over the beast. We're celebrating him taking care of us, rescuing us, because we know what's going to happen. We know the outcome. We're able to worship on this side of the Red Sea, on this side of that moment of crossing, because we know who God is. We know that we can worship him now and be rescued in the future. Revelation 15, the end of verse 2 it says, they held harps given them by God and sang the song of Moses, the servant of God. God is going to hand out instruments when we get into his presence. Some of us aren't musicians, which is why I'm not up here during worship. I can't play an instrument. I can try to sing, but I can't sing well. But at the same time, it doesn't really matter at this point. God says, here's your instrument. Go ahead and play. You have a voice. Go ahead and sing. We all get an instrument. We're all going to be playing it, and it doesn't matter. God doesn't care about how well it sounds. Whether he makes it sound good or it just sounds good to him, I have no idea. I was actually thinking, you know, when we, when we get those instruments, those harps, and we're playing them and we're singing like Miles was talking about, it doesn't matter what the person next to us hears. It doesn't matter what the person in front of us hears. We're playing for an audience of one. That's all that matters. It's for God and for God alone. You and I will be there if we love Jesus. We will receive the instrument that he has for us, and we will sing together as a group, as a body, standing before that sea. He tells us that we will sing the song of Moses, and we'll sing the song of the Lamb. Both are songs of victory. The only difference being the song of Moses came after they had actually witnessed the victory. And now the song of the Lamb. We're singing this song in the face of evil. Both Moses and us, we live in the same horrible world. But now it's our turn to look into the sea of glass, to look into that fire that represents evil. And still, even though it's between God and us, know that it has no chance of winning. There's no chance of it remaining in our way. We are free to worship God. And that, that's what freedom is for us right now. We have a freedom to worship him. We're able to come in here and to worship God with no, no real persecution. Now we've talked about how that day might be coming. It is already there for other places. But for us, we have, we have no perse persecution right now, so utilize that freedom. Come in here and sing and be happy that you're here. Sing because you know you have victory. You and I will sing at that point, so why haven't we started singing now? We sing of the victory that, that God has created, that he, he has destroyed our enemies, he has destroyed the enemies of God, when I was preparing for this message, I was trying to figure out how do I, how do I visualize this, this day, this time, when we're all standing there, 
We have the, the sea of glass and the fire in front of us and God on the other side, and we're worshiping him with our harps and our voices. And when I was first reading it, and maybe this is how you guys read it too, you first think of the people you know. You first think of the people that you're sitting next to right now, standing beside you that day, worshiping God. But that picture has to be so much bigger. Right now, we are very limited in what we know and what we experience here on this earth. Because there's a whole world out there that we haven't seen. So I have a video that I'm going to play. And this, this is probably the best thing that I could think of to show you to try to, to visualize what that day is going to be like. Let's watch the video. Yeah. 
video gives me chills. <clears throat> Doesn't matter what language it's in. Everybody's worshiping together. Whether you understand it or not, it doesn't matter. God's still getting praise. Whether people look like you or they're from another part of the world, it doesn't matter. Because everything that they've had to go through, everything that you've had to go through, it's over. And you're there to worship God. You're happy that the things that, that other people have had to go through, the things that you've had to go through, are done with. And we get to seeing how great is our God. How great is our God. Just imagining the day makes me long for it. Some of you, maybe you're, you're still not at that point. Maybe you still don't long for that day. Maybe you think about how maybe that day is going to be a struggle. Maybe you look at it from another perspective. One that says, yeah, I'm going to be I'm going to be where I know I'm worshiping God, but what about the people in my life that aren't going to be there? How could a loving and gracious God do that to those that haven't followed him? How could he forever take away the chance for them to come to know him? But my answer is, how could he not? If God loves us, he will not allow Satan to ever harm us again. He will not allow any evildoer to destroy us. He will not allow death or sin or suffering or injustice or evil to ever go on. And it's because he's a loving God that he must do this. In the same way that if, if a man kept breaking into your house and, and each time he came in and he abused your children and he threatened your wife and you caught him and you told him that he had to stop and he had to get out and never come back if that was his intentions and you continued to forgive him and he continued to come back and do it again and do it again and do it again and you never stepped up and made him stop That's not a loving husband. That's not a loving father. He would be just as unjust and cruel and mean as the person doing it by not stopping them. And that's why God has to step up and stop Satan. That's why God has to step up and stop sinners at that point. Because, because God does love us. Because God does love his people. He loves us too much to allow those things to continue to go on forever. For those who fall short, 
repent. Come back to follow him, because we all do. We will have our, our freedom. We will have our forgiveness. We will have our justice because of Christ, not because of anything else. But realize that for every single person on that day, it's their choice whether or not they're going to be the ones worshiping or whether, whether they're going to be the ones receiving justice. We will still be able to sing how great is our God. Because we long for the day where there is no sin. We long for the day when there's no more suffering, no more death, no more evil. We long for the day when we don't need to lock our doors. When we don't have to check and make sure our kid's okay. When they can go outside and play and we don't have to worry. When there's no more sin, when there's no more sinners. There's only God, there's only our brothers and sisters in Christ, and there's no need to lock the door because we're all family. That's what, that's what our loving God has intended for us. He has intended that from the beginning of everything. And it's only because of us and our sin that, that it's messed up. And this is what we will sing. Look at back, look back at Revelation 15. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. We will thank God for who he is. We will thank God for what he's done. Just and true are your ways, king of the ages. God's justice is not impulsive. It's not random. He is very specific and very purposeful. God is accurate in what he's doing. He will be just. Praise God that this life is not all that there is. Praise God that when we walk into the kingdom, it won't be with people who refuse to obey God. It won't be in a place that continues to have sin forever to, de to destroy what is good, the new creation that God has intended for us. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? In that time and in that place, when we see God face to face, and, and we're there with our brothers and sisters from all nations, we will fear God, and we will give him glory. We will fear him and worship him at the same time, the same way we're supposed to now. For you alone are holy. We will recognize that God is different, and he alone is good. And we will sing about it. We will sing, all nations will come and worship before you. We'll be, we'll be there with all of our brothers and sisters from all of human history. All the nations, all the cultures, all the languages, all the tribes, all people. And we will live in a world that perhaps we don't suffer for our faith. How about that? See, there are those in the world right now, our brothers and sisters, that are suffering horribly. Things that we don't even want to think about. They long for the day when they get to stand before God and sing because the sin and sinners of this world are no more. Right now, there are still places in the world where Christianity is outlawed, where the church is underground, where people are persecuted every day. And when we meet them, when we stand there together with them, not just, one, not just with one another, but when we stand there with them and we hear their stories and realize what they've been going through this whole time, even though they're in separate countries right now, we're going to see that we are glad that those people that are hurting them are gone. When we hear about how they've been abused, and we hear that they have been devastated, and they've been tortured because they've been a Christian, we're going to worship God with them and be thankful that they don't have to go through it anymore. So much anger has to reside with God over what's happened throughout human history. But now at this point, we'll see his wrath come to completion. The seven bowls poured out. Those seven bowls, their justice and their consequences. This will be his, his perfect, complete wrath. It will be completed. And all of justice will, will flood upon those people instantly. Okay, many, many of us sin. Many of us, all of us sin. We do things that are wrong. 
And we continue to, to do things that are wrong over and over and over again. And sometimes we get to the point where our, our heart becomes so hardened that we don't even care anymore. We continue to do that one thing over and over and over again. Maybe at the beginning, we were like, man, I really shouldn't do this. I need to repent. I need to turn away from what I've been doing. But then at some point, it just gets too hard. And we just give up. And we think because we don't have consequences right now, because there's nothing we can see happening from that sin, that we'll be okay. There's really no penalty. But just because the consequences are delayed doesn't mean there's no penalty. What we see in the bowls is that there is indeed consequence. It's just delayed for a little while. And that God is giving you and me an opportunity right now to continue to apologize and repent and to come back to him and to worship him, to take Jesus' death and place it over our sin so that that bowl that's going to be poured out, it's poured out on him and not on us. But for those who resist, for those who rebel against God, for those who continue to live the way that they're living, God's wrath is coming. If you repent and you turn back to him, you will be standing before the sea of glass. Seeing the fire, you will be amongst those singing praise to God for how awesome he is, how incredibly awesome he is. And you will be glad that you're there. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and we thank you that we have this reason to sing. I pray now, Lord, as we close today, that we take this reason and we apply it right now and we sing with everything that we have to you, not holding back, not sitting and wondering, not thinking about something else that's going on. Allow us just to give you our heart I thank you so much that we have this reason, that we know victory is coming, that we know that you are our rescuer, that you have already sent Christ, and that we will be standing before this sea of glass, before this evil that's between us, and knowing that you are about to conquer it, that you are about to send it away forever. Let's praise you right now for that. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.